Good morning, and welcome to Grace Episcopal Church on this 10th Sunday after Pentecost. I am Father Michael Guy, the director here. Uh, if you are on our mailing list, then you will find the bulletin in two forms, either a PDF or Word document. If you're not on our mailing list, you may go to our website, gracealex.org, and click on the blue banner, and you will find the bulletin there as well. Thank you so much for your continued support in our ministries here at Grace in Alexandria. They are much appreciated, and we can continue to need your help and your support.
Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Grant us, Lord, we pray, the Spirit to thank and do always those things that are right that we, who cannot exist without you, may by you be enabled to live according to your will. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. A reading from the first book of Kings. At Horeb, the mount of God, Elijah came to a cave and spent the night there. Then the word of the Lord came to him saying, what are you doing here, Elijah? He answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left and they are seeking my life to take it away. He said, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Now there was a great wind, so strong that it was splitting mountains and breaking rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a sound of sheer silence. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. Then there came a voice to him that said, What are you doing here, Elijah? He answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. Then the Lord said to him, Go. Return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. When you arrive, you shall anoint Hazael as king over Aram. Also, you shall anoint Jehu, son of Nimshai, as king over Israel. And you shall anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, of Abel Mehola, as prophet in your place. Whoever escapes from the sword of Hazael, Jehu shall kill. And whoever escapes from the sword of Jehu, Elijah, shall kill. Yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel. All the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us say the portion of Psalm 85 responsibly by whole verse. I will listen to what the Lord God is saying, for he is speaking peace to his faithful people and to those who turn their hearts to him. Truly, his salvation is very near to those who fear him, that his glory may dwell in our land. Mercy and truth have met together Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Truth shall spring up from the earth, and righteousness shall look down from heaven. The Lord will indeed grant prosperity, and our land will yield its increase. Righteousness shall go before him, and peace shall be a pathway for his feet. A reading from the letter to the Romans. Moses writes concerning the righteousness that comes from the law, that the person who does these things will live by them. But the righteousness that comes from faith says, do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you on your lips and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. 
Because if you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For one believes with the heart and so is justified. And one confesses with the mouth and so is saved. The scripture says no one who believes in him will be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. The same Lord is Lord of all and is generous to all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. But how are they to call on one in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in one of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone to proclaim him? And how are they to proclaim him unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. That's the reader and hearer of your gospel. The Holy Gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead to the other side, while he dismissed the crowds. After he had dismissed them, he went up to the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But by this time the boat, battered by waves, was far from the land. Far from the wind was against them, and early in the morning he came walking towards them on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, It is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat started walking on the water and came toward Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me! Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, You of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. May the meditations in my heart, the words on my lips, be acceptable in your sight, Jesus. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Good morning, Grace Church, or maybe even good afternoon, or perhaps even good evening, depending on when you're pressing play on the track. For those of you who might be checking us out for the first or second time, uh, I welcome you. My name is Jeremy, and I'm a deacon in the Episcopal Church, and a product of the love and nurturing of this parish. That seems a little weird to say in these very disconnected times, though. Um, because when we think of love and nurturing, we can't help but think about time spent together. Time spent in community and time that the community gathers. For all that we have access to technologically, there is no escaping the fact that we are very much isolated from each other in ways that we still grapple with. We pretend that we're making do, but under the surface, we know better. We think we've gotten used to seeing people wear face masks, but we remember what we remember that we crave seeing someone smile other than through a computer screen. We think we've become accustomed to distorted calls and low bandwidth and delayed reactions, but we actually do remember what it feels like to hear words of encouragement 
without the filter of a cell tower or Wi-Fi. And we think we've gotten used to standing six feet away, but we do remember what it's like to lean in and cheers a buddy with a pint glass or meet somebody new who inevitably tells you that they're a hugger and then proves it to you with a welcome hug hello. We may have gotten used to this new normal, but I don't want us to ignore what's going on with us underneath the surface. At our very cores, we are creators. We create life, we create deepened relationships, we create countless food recipes to share over Instagram TV and TikTok. For the past six months, just because we've been grounded in our homes, it doesn't stop our inner nature of creating. The reality is that if you have to do something with all that creative energy, or it ends up doing something with you. And creative energy can come just as much from isolation, silence, and doubt as it can come from joy, love, and curiosity. Some of the most beautiful art in human history is a product of such silences, such lonelinesses, and such doubts. A vast amount of scripture was actually written either during the Israelite exile, in the case of the New Testament, or in after the ascension of Jesus, in the case of the New Testament, where he was no longer physically there to guide his followers. Scholars call this feeling real absence. Uh, they do it in contrast to what we Episcopalians call real presence, uh, which is Christ incarnate in the Eucharist. And this real absence is all tied to what we do with that gaping hole that we know that it needs to be filled with something. I posted a, a question on Facebook asking people what song of silence, loneliness, or doubt spoke to them? What got to their cores? And what people responded with varied in every genre, style, decade, and artist. No one person had the same answer. It merely proved that so much variation can come from such a basic human emotion. One such piece was the 1965 The Sound of Silence by Simon and Garfield. Five decades later, that song still speaks to us, so much so that DreamWorks put it in their animated film, Trolls. Now, if you haven't seen the movie, I'll just tell you that the troll princess Poppy and her troll friend Branch go to rescue their fellow trolls from the virgins. Large, like, ogres, whose only way to be happy is to eat trolls. Basically, Princess Poppy and Branch use their creative energy to inspire the virgins to find lasting happiness that doesn't come from food. <laughs> Talk about it, lesson. <laughs> which then leads to the trolls and the Bergens actually living together and creating a better life for everyone. The Simon and Garfunkel song comes in about a third of the way through the movie. And in that scene, um, Princess Poppy sings the sound of silence to her fellow companion, Branch. Now she's upbeat, and you can tell that she's trying to empower upbeat optimism to Branch. But what she's actually doing something with this text that well, she, she does this thing with the text that we do with First Kings all the time. She sings that silence has something divine to it. And that may be true. We do hear God in the silence. But next time you watch that movie, I wonder if you also see what I saw, which is Princess Poppy fighting to overcome her feelings of doubt and by using that energy and turning it into something beautiful. That silence that Branch asks for, it, it actually makes her uncomfortable because then she has to live with the doubt that she's feeling. In the case of First Kings, you have to remember that the prophet Elijah has run away to this cave because he's emotionally and physically exhausted. He's the last good prophet in the northern kingdom. And when he seeks God's affirmation, he's met with silence. Now, I've heard and read this scripture preached a lot about finding God in that silence, but I also want us to remember that sometimes we don't hear God in the silence. 
Sometimes it's just deafening and lonely. And in the case of Romans, you have to remember that Paul is writing to a group of Gentiles who have been doing this new Christian thing in Rome without the support or community of any Jews because they had just been expelled. Um, and now are cultural odds with the Jews who are allowed back into the city. So the very identity as followers of Jesus, who was a Jewish prophet, is coming into conflict with what they think they know. And in the case of Matthew, we just heard last week how Jesus fed a whole bunch of people, had a big old miracle happen, and then we learned today that he's like, y'all, I need some time. Uh, I'm going to walk over here and pray a bit. And then he comes back and beckons uh, Peter to walk on water. So, of course, Peter follows Jesus' instructions, but even having witnessed that previous miracle of feeding, of feeding that, that crowd, Peter still has doubts. He has doubts about himself. Because he's also the one walking on water. And that doubt manifests, and he nearly drowns. But that isn't the end of any of those stories. In Trolls, when they're in the darkest, the darkness, Branch finds his creative spirit. In Matthew, Jesus catches Peter. In Romans, Paul reminds us that it only takes faith. Everything else is just icing on the cake. And in 1 Kings, after the deafening silence, Elijah hears God call him forward to carry on with his blessings. Our isolations, those moments of doubt, of loneliness, of silence, can actually be moments when God calls something truly great out of us. The things that are created when we use those pent-up feelings of silence, isolation, and doubt can manifest in ways that are miraculous if we use them for such a purpose. But they can also put us in harm's way. I'm not surprised that numbers of people cast their concerns aside and played fast and loose without regard to social distancing at beaches and house parties. That creative energy, it, it shows up in all kinds of ways, in big and in small. It shows up when we doodle or fidget. It shows up when our country erupts in riots because black Americans can no longer take being silenced and ignored. What we create from our lonelinesses, our doubts, and our silence is as important as what we create with those joys, accomplishments, and communities. If you need biblical evidence, Look no further than the very first story in the whole Bible. The one in which God takes chaos, loneliness, and silence, and makes light, makes day and night, and makes humanity. So I ask you, what are you doing with this silence, this loneliness, this chaos now? Will you be an Elijah who heard God call and answered it? Will you heed Paul's words and be willing to take a leap of faith? Will you be like Peter and potentially drown, but instead be caught by Christ's arms? I debated not giving this next example because of how extreme the, the two cases are. But as hyperbolic as, as it, they may seem, I still think that these are worth sharing. In the 20th century, Two very different men spent time in jail. Both men used that time, that energy that came from their isolation, their silence, and their doubts, and created some things profound. One man, one of those two men, wrote Mein Kampf, which led to horrificness. The other one, wrote a letter from the Birmingham jail which resonates in your heart in ways that I have not read other than in scripture, to be honest. 
I promise that in this time of loneliness, doubt and silence, every single one of you will produce something. I merely ask you, what will it be? Amen. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made in him. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has, he has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Father, we pray for your holy Catholic Church. That we all may be one. Grant that every member of the Church may truly and humbly serve you that your name may be glorified by all people. We pray for all bishops, priests, and deacons, that they may be faithful ministers of your word and sacraments. We pray for all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world, that there may be justice and peace on the earth. Give us grace to do your will in all that we undertake that our works may find favor in your sight. Have compassion on those who suffer from any grief or trouble, especially those affected by the coronavirus around the world, their caregivers, and all those working on the front lines of the crisis. That they may be delivered from their distress. Give to the departed eternal rest, especially all those who have died from the coronavirus, and all those killed in acts of terror, violence, and war around the world. Let light perpetual shine upon them. We praise you for your saints who have entered into joy. May we also come to share in your heavenly kingdom. Let us pray for our own needs and those of others. O Lord our God, accept the fervent 
prayers of your people in the multitude of your mercies. Look with compassion upon us and all who turn to you for help. For you are gracious, O lover of souls, and to you we give glory, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against thee in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. Ascribe to the Lord, be honored through his name, bring offerings and sacrifices to God.
in the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ, and bring us to that heavenly country where, with all your saints, we may enter the everlasting heritage of your sons and daughters, through Jesus Christ our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, the author of our salvation. By him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory are yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Take these gifts and feed on them in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. Let us pray. My Jesus, I believe that you are present in the Blessed Sacrament I love you above all things, and I desire you in my soul. Since I cannot now receive you sacramentally, come spiritually into my heart, as though you were already there. I embrace you and unite myself wholly to you. Permit me not that I should ever be separated from you. Amen. Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with the spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world to get peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of the heart. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you forever. Amen.
Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.